Welcome to the New Books Network. Hello and welcome back to New Books in the American West, a channel on the New Books Network of podcasts. I am Stephen Hausman, uh, and I'm your host for today's interview. And I'm excited today to be speaking with Dr. Philip Deloria. Dr. Deloria is the Leverett Saltonstall Professor of History at Harvard University and is the current president of the Organization of American Historians. He is the author of several award-winning books and of many articles, and today we're discussing his latest book, Becoming Mary. Mary Sully, Toward an American Indian Abstract, which came out with the University of Washington Press in 2019. Uh, Welcome to the show, Phil. Good to have you. It's great to be here, Steve. Thank you so much for having me. Why don't we begin, as we always do on the New Books Network, by just hearing a little bit about yourself. So tell us about your academic background uh, and how you became interested in history and in American studies. So, you know, I have I have a, a rambling kind of uh, academic background, which is something that I oftentimes share with students, uh, particularly students who are sort of feeling uncertain about where they, you know, might go. I started um, as an undergraduate as a music performance major at the University of Colorado. I was a trombone player after um, a couple of years and realization that I, I wasn't really that great a trombone player. I switched to music education. I became a middle school band and orchestra teacher. Um, and then I had a bit of a lost year where I, you know, played in a band and uh, did substitute teaching and coached basketball. It was the first time then when I thought about actually maybe writing and maybe writing about the American West. I started a book that's never been finished about the Platte River and sort of the you know, an experiential kind of romp, you know, along the uh, along the plat. Um, I uh, I got involved in music video and music video production. I went back and did a master's degree also at the University of Colorado in broadcast journalism, um, and I worked as a night video editor. And somewhere along the way, and there I did a documentary on uh, Lakota land claims in the Black Hills, and that was sort of the beginning of a kind of transition for me um, away from these sort of music and video roots, um, you know, back around to sort of my own family's legacy. Um, you know, my dad, Vine Deloria Jr., my grandfather, Vine Deloria Sr., my two um, incredibly talented great aunts, um, Mary Sully, um, also known as Susan Deloria and, and Ella Deloria, who worked with Franz Boas at Columbia. So I, I came back around to what was, you know, a a quite substantial and oftentimes intimidating, um, you know, sort of intellectual tradition. And, you know, I should say to that, I would add also my uncle, Sam Deloria, um, really an important figure when it comes to Native American legal training, um, you know, over the years. Um, I found myself um, somewhat by accident in the American Studies program at at, uh, at Yale, and uh, um, I went in there sort of thinking of myself as a communications scholar because that's what I'd done my master's degree on. But um, you know, found myself more and more interested in American Studies and particularly in the historical kind of side of it. Um, you know, although like most American Studies people, I've been very happy to engage in, you know, art and material culture and literary studies, um, you know, uh, as well. Um, you know, and then I was very fortunate to have a, a kind of a first book, my first book playing Indian, uh, sort of explode in my head, as I've sometimes told people in a about a minute, uh, <laughs> minute long period uh, of my life. And, uh, um, and that book, which is about uh, non-Native people who sort of take their ideas about Indians and then perform them by dressing up. Uh, you know, that that book was sort of my my passageway into, you know, into the academy. I was really fortunate to go back to the University of Colorado as an assistant professor and then moved in 2020 to, um, <laughs> couldn't be 2020, it would be 2000, uh, to the University of Michigan uh, and then came in January of 2018 to uh, to Harvard. I think that's probably very beneficial for, for students to hear. You know, they, they so often feel like they need to have this track that they're on from such an early stage. And so I bet to hear that story about how you bounced around to all these different things before becoming a scholar such as yourself, that's probably very beneficial and helpful for them to hear. I, I think it has been. You know, I, I share that student's story with undergraduates a fair amount. And, and as well, you know, my, 
I got married during, you know, at the very beginning of my lost year of, you know, playing music and stuff. And I, I you know, have a recollection of my dear father-in-law sort of shaking his head slowly, <laughs> wondering, <laughs> you know, what kind of future, you know, was, was, was to be had with this sort of character. And, you know, I mean, I should say, I mean, you know, uh, playing music and playing it, you know, not particularly well as I did, you know, um, uh, it, it for me, I, I, I should say, it inculcated in me a sort of sense of, um, you know, of, of, you know, humility. I think, um, mm-hmm. you know, sort of taking on that that career. I mean, if people who are interested in music and who really want to do it and play music, you know, have a real passion for it. And there's a, I think, cold slap in the face that that oftentimes, you know, comes to people, you know, like me and others who are like, you know, pretty good you know, not good enough, right, to make mm-hmm, it in a very, mm-hmm. very competitive kind of, uh, you know, kind of environment. So, uh, yeah, yes, yes. <laughs> and what about this book's genesis? How did you become interested in the story of Mary Sully? Well, so, you know, um, in the mid-70s, uh, my great aunt Ella Deloria passed on. She died in 1971. And, um, you know, in the sort of figuring out of her estate, um, one of the things that was floating around there was this collection of drawings that had been done by her sister, Susie Deloria, a.k.a. Mary Sully. And, uh, you know, at one point, my grandfather basically sent this box, uh, you know, to our house, to my mom and said, look, you're a librarian. Do what librarians do, you know, catalog it or something. You know, I, I just did, but he, he kind of wanted to get it out of his own um house and, and not have to worry about it anymore. So my mom and I, uh, this box arrived at our house, this big gray box, uh, kind of archival box with the steel reinforced corners. And, you know, we opened it up and we, we looked at these drawings and they were really interesting. Um, they were hard to make sense of. You know, each one has a name attached to them. She called these things the, the personality prints. Um, they all had a name attached to them. We, we knew almost none of the names. Um, they were obscure people from the 1930s that seemed to make not much sense, you know, um, you know, not makes not not makes sense to us. Um, you know, there'd been a sort of family sense that she was, you know, kind of not wholly there and that she was she was very shy. Um, she you know, avoided talking to people and she spent a lot of time up in her room, you know, sort of making these drawings. So there was this interesting question of, well, what do we do with these? What do we make of these? And and what happened in the family was to be basically put them away for many, many years. And um, at one point we thought they'd all been damaged. My parents had had a house fire um, in 1994 and we were just quite, not quite sure where they were, you know, after that. But it turns out my mom had sort of transferred from them, them from the box into a very large suitcase and sort of tucked them away under a stairwell in the basement. And, uh, you know, after my dad passed, uh, my mom and I pulled them out and looked at them again, but this time, you know, with a laptop um, and Google. And uh, so suddenly we'd pull out an image for, let's say, Alice Fazende, and we'd Google Alice Fazende, and we'd try to figure out, you know, who she was. And um, what I came to discover was that the more you knew about these people, the more interesting these drawings became. Um, and, uh, you know, at one point I did a very short little paper um, on these um, at a joint conference that was put together by the National Museum of the American Indian and the um, Museum of American Art, uh, the Smithsonian's. Um, and uh, art historians came up to me afterwards and said, you know, this is really interesting stuff. You should do something more with it. And I spent the next decade um, juggling between being an academic administrator and trying to um, trying to work on this book. So it unfolded very slowly. Um, and oftentimes in the context of giving talks, um, rather than sort of diving into a research archive per se. So it has an interesting kind of history in terms of its own development. And I feel as though, you know, and like as scholars, we're often hoping to enter into the archive and come across that like amazing catch of documents that's going to just like completely upend how we view some field. And for you, it sounds like that catch of documents was sitting in your own family archives in basements and in attics for years and years. It was indeed. And I think I've told people like this is the best project of my career. And and the reason is, is because the material is so rich. The art is so interesting and so amazing. And the 
the the corollary to this, right, for historians thinking about archives is that, you know, she left behind, Mary Sully left behind almost no writing at all. Uh, and the writing that is there is nestled within the archive of her sister, Ella Deloria, who left behind a lot of writing. Um, and so there's an interestingly un, uneven quality, right, to the archival material that is available. She's, Mary Sully is known, is knowable in as much, you know, through her art as anything else and not very much through, you know, through her writing, um, except as she's reflected, right, in some of the correspondence that her sister, um, you know, was actually producing. Well, before we get into her art, why don't we learn a little bit about Mary Sully, the person? Who was Susan Deloria, a.k.a. Mary Sully? When was she born? What is her personal history? So she was born in 1896, um, she died in 1963, um, and she sits within, uh, you know, a really interesting collection of that generation. Ella, who was born in 1889, died in 71, and then my grandfather, Vine Deloria Sr., who was born in 1903. So they're all late 19th, early 20th century um, folks. Her father, Philip J. Deloria, the person I'm named for, was one of the first um, uh, native Dakota um, Episcopal ministers. He was an ordained minister, and he was the um, missionary, Episcopal missionary at Standing Rock. Um, you know, for for much of his much of his life, which is where the sisters and my grandfather uh, grew up. They went to um, Saint Elizabeth's Episcopal Mission School and. Um, Wakpala, South Dakota, on the Standing Rock Reservation. Um, but, you know, what was interesting about them is that they, and it's Mary Sully and, and Susie, um, I should say Susie and Ella's story kind of line up in some ways. You know, as part of this, um, you know, kind of church background, you know, they, they grew up um, with a pretty decent education. Um, St. Elizabeth's um, you know, really did give them a pretty good um, education. And then they went to the All Saints School in Sioux Falls, um, South Dakota, which was kind of the place where the children of colonial administrators um, went. Ella then went on to go to Oberlin and then later to the Teachers College at Columbia. Um, Mary Sully was quite different. She was really not um, particularly interested in the academic um, side of things. So after All Saints, she basically returned home and, you know, sort of um, hunkered down a little bit, was taking care of her father and, you know, being um, sort of a domestic daughter, um, you know, in that sense. But she always had a sense that she was good at art, right, and drawing and penmanship. And these were things that were really taught, you know, in those um, in those schools. She um, would c go with Ella um, on some of her trips and travels. Ella um, went to work for the YWCA. She worked at Haskell Indian School. Um, Mary Sully went with Ella in some of those occasions. And then for a while, she took courses, as far as I can tell, maybe three or four courses, not many, at the University of Kansas. Um, but those classes really define the project in these very interesting kinds of ways. She took a course on American art. She took a course on American design. Um, and she took, as far as I can tell, kind of a studio arts um, kind, of, uh, kind of class. Ella had hopes that she would actually finish college, but that, that never really happened. Um, but she did, I think, take some of the things that she learned there and started this drawing project in the late 1920s, um, I believe. Um, really escalated it through the 1930s. She was quite active. Um, there are 134 of these images. They're all triptychs, so it's a lot of drawing. And she seems to have stopped working on it sometime in the 1950s. She started working at that point on some ethnographic illustrations for some of the work that Ella was doing and some illustrations for a book of Dakota legends that Ella was going to put together. So she didn't really give up on her artistic interests, um, you know, when she stopped the project, but um, she did eventually stop making these these interesting drawings and kind of bundled them all up and moved on to other things. And what is the context? You talked a little bit about this, but what's, what's the context that Mary Sully is creating her art in? What is going on around her, both in terms of Native American history and American history more broadly in the first half of the 20th century? And how do you see that as affecting her art and what she's creating? Yeah, I mean, I think she's in the middle of this very, very interesting 
you know, kind of moment. I mean, if we think about about native history of the early 20th century, <clears throat> you know, um, you know, we're really looking at you know, sort of one of those demographic low points, um, native native population kind of at at its lowest point around 1900 and sort of escalating rebounding a little bit um, after that, you know, hard press, right, on assimilation kinds of programs. Um, you know, her own background, which was both reservation-based, but also based in the Episcopal Church, left her in a really complicated, you know, kind of place or, or, or position. Um, but then, you know, in, in 1934, you know, you get the Indian New Deal, and you get all of these really interesting things that are happening um, around you know, what will become tribal governance. And so the sisters are there thinking about it. I think there is a politics to this art that comes out of that um, that particular moment. So those things are important and they, they do matter to this. Um, in terms of the aesthetics of it, um, she's very clearly interested in sort of um, modernism as it leaves Europe and comes to the United States in the first couple decades of the 20th century. And I think you can see in her work a lot of the kind of modernist inclinations um, that that might have shown up in the aughts and the teens and the 20s. Um, she's also really interested in design and industrial design, and that too is a thing that is really kind of happening, you know, in the U.S. Also with some European roots in those first, you know, first couple of decades. Um, and the design world has. Um, you know, they're interested in fabrics and they're interested in, you know, g g cloth and wallpaper and um, linoleum patterns and things like this. And there's a certain kind of vernacular opportunity um, contests where you submit your designs. And, and I think she's a little bit part of that, you know, that world as well. And then there's an interesting world of native arts, which is really, um, you know, also in a kind of an emergent and transitional sort of space. And we can date that to the same sort of periods, you know, particularly in places like New Mexico, where you have museum folks and anthropologists, ethnographers, curators, who are trying to sort of think about ways to be patrons and collectors and, um, you know, of native arts. Uh, and that, you know, sort of really amps up in the 1930s and then continues on through through mid-century and into the present present day. But she's quite different, I think, from uh, a lot of those native artists who are either sort of recapturing older, say, pottery traditions or design traditions, um, or who are being kind of sponsored and led into a sort of primitivist um, native arts that makes sense to American modernists, right? Um, and so much of that art is has has kind of canonical you know dimensions to it um uh, you know flat backgrounds two dimensional traditional kinds of themes um you know those sorts of things you know and her art is is wildly different from that is completely abstract in all kinds of interesting ways and i think really does look as much to american modernism um you know as it does to some of these emergent uh, native arts. It's also, I think it's fair to say that she fits within a kind of category that's really also emergent in the 1930s of sort of folk or vernacular kind of, uh, you know, kinds of kinds of arts, which stands, you know, alongside you know, regionalism and, and precisionism and, and some of the other kinds of things that are happening in the 1930s. So she's got a very complicated, I think, um, kind of positioning relative to the arts world, which is why I see her as both a Native American artist, but also an American artist, um, you know, uh, in the broadest possible sense. It can be difficult sometimes to talk about visual art in an audio medium, and I strongly encourage uh, my my listeners to, you know, not just Google image search marriage Sully, but to go out and buy the book as well. But but with that said, can you describe her art style a little bit? Maybe uh, uh, maybe kind of explain what these personality prints look like a bit. How did she choose her subjects? How did she present her subjects? What what does this art look like? Yeah, well, I will do my best to talk about art in, a video, <laughs> in an audio medium. Um, so as I said, they're triptychs, which is to say they're three panel kinds of works, and they're meant to be suspended, um, connected to each other in a kind of vertical arrangement. They're about um, the top two panels um, are more or less the same size, although curiously, they're not exactly the same size, about 18 by 24. Um, 
the bottom panel is a little smaller. They are meant to be hung sort of in a vertical arrangement, a top panel, a middle panel, and a bottom panel. And then there's a tag also attached at the bottom. So there are really four panels, if you count it that way, uh, a label that has the name of the person that this art is supposed to represent. Um, I know this because the, you know, when we pulled them out of the suitcase, you know, most of them were still connected. She had taped them together uh, in order to sort of put together a couple of shows, small displays that she did primarily at Indian schools, actually, um, interestingly. So, so the top panel, you know, has a kind of symbolic or representational, you know, sort of character, um, but pointing towards abstraction. Um, you know, a lot of times you can uh, tell kind of what's going on um, in the image, but maybe not wholly or completely. So let me give you an example. There's a um, one for a harp player, a harpist named Mildred Dilling. And uh, if you look at the image, you'll see the uh, sort of set of vertical lines, um, which once you realize it's Mildred Dilling, you can understand that these are perhaps representations of harp strings. And then these two colored, very complicated, triangulated sort of figures that come to a fine point at one of these um, lines, which are, um, when you understand Mildred Dilling is a harpist, you can represent them as sort of fingers that are actually playing, you know, on the harp. So it's representational, um, it's abstracted, um, these are not real fingers, they're multicolored diamond, you know, kinds of shapes. Um, but it is, um, can, can conveys enough information, right, enough of a message that we understand Mildred Dilling's character is about playing the harp. and color is something that Mary Sully used a lot to represent sort of intangible kinds of things, including sound. So the sort of brightly colored triangles here that make up the fingers, um, you know, are wholly consistent with some of the other things she did. Then in the second panel, what happens is there's a design pattern, oftentimes drawing from the images and the iconographies and the color and the pattern of the first um, image. So I tend to think that these were produced in this sequence, the top panel, then the second panel. Um, there's enough evidence that I think it's a reasonable, um, you know, kind of assumption. So in the Mildred Dilling piece, for example, what you can see is uh, a kind of cascading pattern, uh, design pattern that repeats several times. Uh, then incorporates sort of strings and sound waves in a kind of a spirally sort of thing. When you look at this, you're like, oh, this is the sound of a person doing sort of glissando work on a harp, going, you know, kind of these fingers, you know, arms waving across the strings and creating these sort of sonic sounds. Um, and then the bottom panel is a, is, is, it, it tends to be very abstract, geometrical, oftentimes with native kinds of geometrical uh, sorts of um, representations. And these are the geometries of um, Great Plains native women's arts in particular, things like beadwork and quill work and quilting and parflesh painting. Um, you know, so lots of um, symmetrical kinds of things, rotational symmetry, right, in a circle oftentimes. Um, and, but again, riffing on or drawing on some of the images and iconographies and patterns of the first two, um, you know, the first two images. Um, so when you take them together as a whole, you really are led to ask, you know, what's the relationship among these, uh, you know, these images? Is it developmental? Does the first one develop into the second, which develops into the third? Um, you know, how are they how are they sorted? And I, that's one of the things I've tried to do in the book is to put some categories around them and sort of read them across multiple images to see if I can, um, you know, make, uh, you know, make sense of them. As far as how she chose her subjects, um, you know, she was a, um, she was a native ethnographer, I think, of American popular culture. She was really interested in film, uh, film stars, um, celebrities, radio folks, um, opera singers, inventors, you know, uh, she has a whole thing on Thomas Edison, she does Henry Ford, she does um, uh, a guy named, uh, uh, what's his name, Steinmetz, who figures out how to convert um, alternating and direct current back and forth. I mean, I, so some of her figures are completely mysterious, um, you know, to me. She assembled an archive of um, popular magazines, uh, 
27 of the 134 uh, people who are represented here appeared on the cover of Time magazine. Many, many of the other ones appeared inside the pages of Time magazines. Um, she subscribed to the Saturday Evening Post. Um, I mentioned Alice Vizende, for example, earlier. Alice Vizende shows up in the in the historical record exactly twice, as far as I can tell. She was the last Confederate widow, uh, and she shows up in 1934 in one of those tiny little three-line filler kind of things that you would find in the in the you know, the bottom of a column of um, an article in a magazine. Um, and then in 1939, when she dies, there's a tiny little kind of story about her. She, you know, has sort of, you know, been engaged to a Confederate soldier who went off to fight and he was killed and she never married again and was sort of celebrated as kind of one of these relics of the Civil War, you know, in the mid 20th century. So some of them are quite obscure um, like that. Other ones are quite, um, quite well known. But they really do range the gamut across um, American popular culture. I don't know how to say this uh, more formally, but the art is just extremely cool looking. <laughs> like it's just it's just it's just a really uh, uh, striking set of images that you've presented in the book. Um, yeah. I yeah, think this, keep going. It, no, it's exactly right, Steve. I mean, it's it's you. It it sounds odd to describe this stuff, but I think the experience of seeing it, as with so much, uh, you know, art, to be in its presence is really, um, you know, quite something. And, you know, for years I resisted um, uh, doing what I should do, which is which I have now done, which is to have an informal, you know, storage and climate controlled and very safe and secure things. I kept it at home and I carried it around with me and I took it out a lot as I was working on the book to look at it because it is so beautiful. I mean, it really is beautiful and it's and it's cerebral. It's quite intellectual. Um, the more that you engage it, the more you think about it, you, the more you realize what's going on and that it's yeah. very, very smart. Um, I think that's yeah. the other thing. Um, I particularly like the Babe Ruth print, uh, which is made up of, if I remember correctly, a set of, of of diamonds and kind of these small dots and circles that are kind of akin to baseballs. And I just, I thought that was just the the coolest thing. I really, I really like that one. That one is great, you know, because she does both a riff on sort of the diamond as the base, as a, you know, the field for baseball, but also the diamond as a kind of signifier of wealth and flashiness. And she's trying to capture something about Babe Ruth, you know, himself as a larger than life, you know, sort of personality. I mean, if we're talking about baseball, the other um, one that I, I really love is Dizzy Dean, uh, you know, a uh, pitcher for St. Louis and a sort of all-star in 1934 and won the World Series. And so what she's done there is she has this very interesting uh, kind of a brown diamond um, to reflect the baseball, but also sort of um, kind of a pinstripe, a, sort of a curving pinstripe sort of pattern. And then in the very center of the top image, this baseball. Um, and what she's and then around the baseball she's got this colored lifesaver <laughs> kind of kind of design with a lot of color sort of flowing and flashing in it um and uh the stitching on the ball which is in the shape of diamonds matches up with the stitching on sort of these pinstripe kinds of um things figures that are arrayed around it which are actually very very small rectangles so the eye actually sort of sees a continuity between the rectangles and the, the sort of diamond stitching of the ball, but it's not quite enough of a continuity, right? There's enough distinction. And then this colored lifesaver sits there. And if you let your eye play on the lifesaver and the ball and the background, what you realize is she's created this kind of optical illusion so that it looks like the ball is actually coming at you, is actually moving out of the lifesaver. Um, and then in the second panel, what she does is she takes the color of the lifesaver and she turns it into what I call the Apple computer spinning wheel of death, right, which she invented in the 1930s, you know, here, which I think re reflects the experience of having a baseball thrown by Dizzy Dean come at you. You know, so there's a real kinesthetic kind of quality, right, to some of these these works, you know, they're just really smart and stunning. <laughs> 
And one of the things that I thought was most fascinating about the larger story that you tell here is just looking at American celebrity at this moment when American celebrity is becoming a thing, when it's basically being invented in popular culture. And by looking at celebrity through Mary Sully's art and kind of through her eyes a little bit, you start to get a sense of how Americans were making sense of these people that they were reading about and hearing about and seeing about in film and newsreels. It's a really interesting way of looking at the culture of very early American and celebrity, I thought. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I do. I mean, I called her a sort of ethnographer of American culture, and I think it's true, right? She's she's a biographer in a, a sort of an aesthetic biographer in a way, right? She wants to take these individuals and really try to capture them. Um, and so much of what she's capturing is, of course, her own sort of sensibilities, you know, around these kinds of things. But when you add them up, right, in an aggregate, and you've got sort of the popular culture of the 1930s um, and some of the high culture of the 1930s as well, you do get this this sort of picture of America, right, in this in this really interesting moment when celebrities and mass culture and popular culture are being sort of consumed and navigated and people are trying to make sense and trying to make meaning of it. And here you have this person who sits on the sort of American margins, right? I mean, has a, a different kind of cultural eye. I mean, this is the ethnographic eye in that sort of sense, right? Um, as as anthropologists would say, she is etic and imic at the same time, right? Um, and so it's it's quite... Uh, wonderful, I think, what she's able to do there. Let's talk a bit more about the arc of Mary Sully's life. And in particular, I'm interested in her relationship with her family during the, the first half of the 20th century when she lived. And in particular, can you tell us a bit about her relationship with her sister, Ella? Yeah, so El Ella was um, an amazing person. And she's Ella's always been regarded as kind of the genius of the family. <laughs> um, uh, you know, Ella, as I said, went to Oberlin and then went to Columbia to the Teachers College. She was very, very comfortable moving around in New York. She worked with Franz Boas um, and then later Ruth Benedict and Margaret Mead. Um, she was the um, YWCA's uh, sort of secretary for Indian uh, girls education. She traveled around a lot to different reservations and different schools. And um, uh, and so, so Ella is this sort of extraordinary person. She um, in the late 1920s, right as Mary Sully is starting her work, Ella basically established herself with Boaz um, as a kind of field worker and, uh, you know, would do uh, sort of ethnographic collecting trips on Boaz's behalf, um, you know, to the Dakota reservations. Um, and so Mary Sully would accompany Ella on these things. She was sort of sitting side by side, although very, very quietly um, as Ella, you know, kind of, uh, you know, kind of did her thing. But what I've come to realize is the ways in which that this, these two sisters were completely feeding, um, you know, off of one another um, in really interesting and smart ways. They, they must have just, you know, had this incredible tense and incredible conversation going on around all the questions that were really central, um, you know, in that moment. So Ella is thinking a lot about race, um, race formation. Um, she gets involved in a early project um, that, uh, that Boaz puts together with a, a social psychologist named Otto Kleinberg. And the idea is uh, they're going to develop intelligence tests uh, one for sort of New York City white people, one for kind of Appalachian white mountaineers, one for um, uh, Native Americans, and one for African Americans. And they actually have Zora Neale Hurston sort of assigned to develop this intelligence test that's coming out of an African American cultural kind of context. And this is the moment when Zora Neale, Zora Neale Hurston kind of turns her back a little bit on this. And, um, you know, goes off to do her own thing and really becomes, you know, a, a folklorist in her own, you know, in her own right. But Ella actually develops the intelligence tests um, that come out of a Native American context, which will then be administered to people in these other kinds of groups, right? And what they're after is this sort of thing about testing and intelligence and race and culture and environment and, um, so the test is, I mean, I, I find this to be a very, you know, signal moment, right? The test that Ella comes up with is memorizing beadwork designs, uh, you know, and, and this is something that comes completely out of the experience of Mary Sully, right? Who's working in exactly that kind of um, 
you know, that kind of medium. So there you have the sisters kind of working together around these, um, these things. I've seen Ella in terms of um, what's called culture and personality anthropology, which is sort of developed in that Boazian school and, you know, takes form in 1934 with Ruth Benedict's book, Patterns of Culture. You know, Ella's right there in New York sort of talking with this group of people as they're thinking about questions about how personality and how culture, you know, uh, can be mobilized in a sort of social psychology, anthropological kind of, um, you know, kind of moment. And isn't that exactly what Mary Sully's project is, right? Part of my argument in the book is that it is a um, kind of vernacular and aesthetic version of culture and personality anthropology. I mean, it's not by accident, I think, that she called these things the personality prints and that she was interested in how personality fit within the broader matrix, uh, you know, of culture. So, you know, Ella and, and Susie are, are kind of joined at the hip um, on these things and their their intellectual work and their actual intellectual projects are, are, are very, very similar. So it makes sense, I think, that later on in Ella's career, as she decides to, um, you know, she moves into fiction writing. Her book, Water Lily, is considered this really interesting early work of ethnographic fiction or ethnographic novel. Um, you know, as I mentioned before, she starts but never finishes this project about Dakota folk tales and legends. But Mary Sully did a number of illustrations for these, and it's, um, it's a kind of wonderful uh, a uh, bit of evidence for how her later style really emerged. Lots of design features, but lots of more representational kinds of drawings and a much more sophisticated sort of use of um, her primary medium, which was colored pencil. I forgot to mention this. You know, she, her artwork was produced using the materials of the poor. Um, you know, so colored pencils were her, you know, were, were sort of her, her way of doing business. And there are moments in the art where you can see, um, for example, in the early, bits of it she just she may have a, a package of eight colored pencils right the palette is much more limited and then there are these moments in the 1930s where the art kind of explodes and you're thinking well she must have gotten the 64 pack you know of colored pencils because there's so much more color going on and so much uh you know more richness so you can see her evolve over time at the same time that ella is evolving uh over time but i think what's really interesting is the ways that that um the issues that concerned Ella, which are then visible in Susie's art or Mary Sully's art, um, are the defining issues really of the mid 20th century, you know, intellectual world, uh, you know, of New York and beyond. I'm wondering also about what Mary Sully's relationship to the art world was. And you talked a little bit about this earlier, about how in some ways she kind of sits outside of the galaxy of Native art that's going on in other parts of the United States. So can you maybe talk a little bit more about that, about how Mary Sully's art maybe complicates or expands our understanding of what Native art looked like and meant in the first half of the 20th century? You know, so much of the ways that um, the American art world has thought about Native American art has been through the lens of primitivism, um, you know, and, y you know, where European artists are looking towards, you know, Tahiti or Africa um, and taking these sort of primitivist lessons, um, you know, there's a whole sort of discussion about how American artists, you know, glom on to Native American art um, as representations of this kind of primitivist ideal. Um, what she does, I think, is completely explodes that <laughs> that idea um, at all. Because when you think about the ways in which primitivism sort of boxes Indian artists up, um, you know, it forces them into certain kinds of training. It forces them into certain kinds of, uh, you know, canonic canonical kinds of practices. Um, and there's never an assumption then that they're going to function as artists sort of completely on their own, within their own kinds of um, interests as individuals or as people who are reflective or representative of their, you know, of their cultures. And I think what's really important about this art is that it just explodes that primitivist sort of um, structure uh, altogether. Which is not to say that like Mary Sully was not re willing to represent herself, right, in the primitivist kind of form. You know, there's a uh, you know, kind of picture of her, a uh, kind of promo or marketing picture where she's, you know, wearing this, 
kind of beautiful, rich blanket, and she's got a headdress on, and she's wearing braids, and she's, you know, kind of framing herself as a kind of archaic Indian princess, um, you know, kind of figure. But the art itself um, really does defy that. There's no way to sort of look at it or to look at the subject matter and to see it as anything other than modernist, you know, kinds of art that is inflected by and done from a native kind of um, kind of position. So, you know, part of my argument, I think, has been, um, you know, sort of twofold, that we, we tend to think about native modernism in relation to, you know, the kind of later 1940s, 1950s, the emergence of the Institute of American Indian Arts, the Santa Fe School, um, folks like Oscar Howe or Joe Herrera, um, you know, uh, and it's so it's, it's got the kind of masculinist quality that, uh, uh, you know, oftentimes abstraction has had in the broader context, right? I mean, you have Kandinsky and people, you know, people like that who are inventing, you know, modernist abstraction. Um, you know, for me, one of the really, really stunning things that's happened over the last few years has been the ways that that American art narrative um, and, and broader narrative about European modernism as well, you know, has been, you know, kind of blown apart by all kinds of, um, you know, new scholarship. Um, the exhibit of Hilma of Klint um, at the Guggenheim, you know, that was a couple years ago. I mean, part of the argument there is that like Hilma of Klint was basically a woman um, with a certain kinds of kind of spiritual sort of sensibility around her who was inventing abstraction before Kandinsky was. And, you know, the parallel here for me is that Mary Sully in some ways was inventing indigenous modernism and indigenous modernist abstraction before this cohort of men who we usually kind of celebrate, you know? And so for me, I mean, that's had two consequences. One is that like to actually reframe native arts around the production of women and a cohort of women seems really, really quite important. So many and so much of the native arts that get produced, you know, are, are made by women um, coming out of traditional, but altered kinds of traditional adaptive, modern kinds of, uh, kinds of context. Um, you know, so that's, that's part of it. This, the second part, I think, is to say, well, you know, um, this is really um, also transcendent of the category of Native American art. I think it's really important for us to keep the category Native American art. I'm not interested in doing any harm or damage to that. It's a really important kind of way of thinking about it. Um, but it's also really important to see her as an American artist within the traditions of American you know, modernism. And so I link her up with folks like, um, you know, Charles DeMuth um, uh, is, is the artist who I've thought about with her in terms of, um, uh, I've thought about her mostly, but but Arthur Dove, um, Marston Hartley, there's a whole bunch of folks um, uh, who she sits amongst, you know, as a, as, as part of a cohort, um, I think. So I think, I think this art is really transformational in terms of thinking about um, how we unspool the old narratives of American art and modernism and abstraction and unspool the old narratives of, of Native American art, um, you know, as well. And as we begin to wrap up, I'm curious about how, uh, I guess, how successful that has been. What is, I guess what I'm asking is, what has the reaction to this book been? You're sort of shining a spotlight on, uh, you know, not a new artist in that, you know, she was making her art almost a, a century ago, but new in the sense that most people have not heard of Mary Sully. So have people begun to recognize her as one of the great Native artists and one of the great artists of her time? Have you had any opportunities to show her? her work? Do you have any interest in having her work shown publicly? I'm curious sort of what, what has happened since this book's publication? Yeah, it's really quite interesting, you know, you know Steve, because I'm, I'm a historian in a history department. Um, you know, I'm an American studies person, and I'm not really an art historian. I tried to retool myself as best I could um, into being an art historian, or at least engaging with the art historical kind of literature. And I would say that, like, on the art history side, you know, the uptake has been um, interest, um, but it's not been quite as much as I thought. And there's, a, there's an interesting thing that happens, you know, with the art history journals, which um, I didn't quite understand. I, this is just a little caution to any of our listeners who are thinking about art history. I had this idea that, you know, um, <laughs> 
as a person who's really not an art historian, um, if I had the opportunity to sort of participate, for example, as a reviewer, as I did in art historical journals, um, I reviewed a really wonderful book by Emily Burns, um, uh, 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 Transnational Frontiers, um, for Art Journal. I had a sense that like this was actually positioning me um, in a way that I could be part of an art historical conversation. But it turns out like that fields are just different, right? And part of the um, uh, the structure of that field is that if you've reviewed in that journal, then they won't review your book <laughs> for a while. <laughs> I, it was totally counterintuitive to me. I did, did not really get it. So, you know, so I, I, in some ways the book has had not, maybe not quite as much visibility in the art history world as, as I would have, you know, as I would have liked, which is not to say that it hasn't had visibility because it, it definitely has. But I think what's most exciting, you know, to me right now is that, like, yes, I am working on a show with, um, you know, uh, three wonderful and amazing curators. Um, and uh, so we're thinking about three different institutions and we're thinking of, you know, um, maybe not able to mount a full kind of, uh, you know, exhibition of all of these images, but, but perhaps 60 of them, you know, 50 or 60 of them, which is... I think more than enough to get a sense of how stunning, um, you know, this this art is. So it is kind of one of the things that is most exciting, um, you know, right now. And and I should say that the art, um, you know, was in a, a really fabulous e exhibition called Hearts of Our People that was done out at the Minneapolis Institute um, of Arts and traveled to four different four different venues. And it's unfortunately happened in the midst of COVID, but um, but I have to say, you know, I went to two of the openings. I went to the opening at, at MIA in Minneapolis, and I went to the Renwick in D.C. and um, saw the art mounted along with, right, the works of amazing artists at the Renwick. It was sort of flanking this beautiful um, Nora Naranjo Morris um, kind of uh, display. Uh, uh, in Minneapolis, it sort of had its own little kind of transitional sort of um, space, but um, the, the art in the show, this Native women's art, um, is just stunning. And and it was really, you know, my wife and I uh, in Minneapolis just stood there in front of the art and just, you know, wept. I mean, I don't think when Mary Sully died, she had any sense that anything would have happened, you know, with her art. I mean, her career was one of, um, you know, of frustration, you know, of poverty. Um, as I said, the only times that these things were put together and shown, she t taped them, you know, she taped them together and then hung them in the cafeteria at Indian schools, you know, at Pipestone and um, Flandreau. And, um, you know, she saw herself as an artist. She didn't see herself as just a kind of neighborhood doodler. You know, she saw herself as someone who really had a vision. And I think the art itself bears that, you know, bears that out. But, you know, in her lifetime, I think she realized that none of that was going to come to fruition for her. So, um, you know, to see this mounted, you know, in major galleries in the United States now, um, surrounded by fabulous and amazing art. I mean, it's really... I mean, I'm quite humbled by it, and I, I feel quite fortunate to have a small part, you know, in, 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 you know, in just bringing this art out. It's, um, yeah, it's, as I said before, it really is the project of my career, and in, in part it's because of the sort of, you know, small part I'm able to play in bringing this amazing thing and creating the experience that, you know, I know Mary Sully can't necessarily know, but I like to think she's looking down and smiling. If there is one takeaway that you hope your readers come away from this book understanding, what might that be? You know, Steve, I've, I've sort of walked through some of the interventions I think that it that it makes in the American art world, in the world of Native American arts. Um, but in terms of this, I you know, I, I structured the book to return back around after, I think, trying to place her in the most cosmopolitan you know, global kind of context, um, I did want to turn back at the end of the book to place her in a Dakota epistemological 
an aesthetic kind of context. And 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 if there's you know kind of one takeaway, um, perhaps it is for me it would be to return to that that conclusion where. You know, I tried to see her in terms of the um, aesthetic traditions of um, the double woman, um, which is a cultural figure that Dakota people, you know, have used to talk about um, women sort of on the margins, but who have an incredible sort of artistic, you know, sorts of abilities. Um, and in terms of, she, she at one point, you know, there's a letter where these are referred to, they have this other name, they're called the Luta personality prints. And Luta is this word for red that um, you know signifies arts and aesthetics, quill work. It's associated with quill work, that sort of oldest and highest sort of form of Great Plains Native women's arts, um, but also with the act of honoring. And and it does feel to me like sort of trying to see the art in these Dakota sorts of ways is really really important. It's the you know. Um, you know, it's the cherry on the cake, right? Or the cherry on the Sunday at the at the end of it all, right? Is to return back and say, like, here's this amazing cosmopolitan bit of of work, um, and yet it it always already is reflecting, you know, her sort of sense of herself as a native woman um, in native arts and aesthetic and epistemological kinds of kinds of traditions. I mean, that's the nature of her complication. Um, and I think that's that's the important takeaway for me. And finally, I always like to get a preview from my guests about what they are working on next. So since this book has been out for a couple of years now, I'm wondering what you've been working on in the interval. Can we get a preview of what your next project might be? Yes, alas, I, I have abandoned the Platte River long ago. I mean, it was, it was, well, I mean, I may, I may return to it. It's, the Platte River is an amazing and fabulous, um, you know, kind of uh, river. To do a river biography of the Platte, I think is, but there's a few people who've done those things. And um, so I've been, you know, I've been working on, uh, <laughs> I've been, I've been working in two different directions. I mean, one is a series of sort of small writings that really have been taking up um, a bit of a memoiristic kind of um, view of art and music in particular. So I've written, you know, a short little piece about um, T.C. Cannon's guitar. I'm working on a, a guitar essay, you know, right now. I've written a short piece about Jerry Jeff Walker, um, the Texas singer-songwriter for uh, uh you know, edit a collection about sort of the losses of COVID. Um, uh, I've done a couple of little gallery and, and uh, art catalog kinds of essays. So I've I've been trying to sort of like continue the sort of thread that I feel like I have around art and music and, you know, kind of, um, you know, art music criticism. Um, the other thing I've been trying to do is I, I just feel like in Native, you know, Native history and Native studies, we're never not going to need explanatory books that try to help tell people how um, we might understand and think a bit about uh, Native political organization, the, the position of Native tribal nations within the United States today, the ways that we tell stories and kind of master narrative. So it's in the sort of tradition of um, folks like David Troyer, for example, who have been trying to write these sort of you know, public-facing kinds of books. So I've I've got a book that's a series of essays that are thinking a lot about um, uh, sort of Native folks in the kind of politics of narrative in the United States um, today. Um, and it's been interesting, right? I think you know, in the wake of um, COVID and uh, you know George Floyd and sort of the kind of mass movements for racial justice. Um, the emergence of the term BIPOC, for example, things like that. There's been, a, um, you know, uh, Rutherford Falls and Reservation Dogs and things like that. There's been a, you know, a kind of noticeable, you know, presence of the indigenous, right, in American culture over the last couple of years. Um, and yet, you know, it, it's always felt to me that the the eye in the BIPOC is, is still a skinny eye, <laughs> you know, and and I like this book that I've been working on, this little set of essays is an effort to kind of fatten that up a little bit, um, you know, if, if possible. So it talks a bit about law, about cons the Constitution, a bit about how we think about slavery, um, about how we might tell some alternative American stories. But, you know, um, I'm, a, I'm busy. <laughs> I'm busy with stuff. It's not, it's not going as fast as I would like. <laughs>
Dr. Philip Deloria is the Leverett Saltonstall Professor of History at Harvard University and is the current president of the Organization of American Historians. His newest book is Becoming Mary Sully, Toward an American Indian Abstract, which came out with the University of Washington Press in 2019. Thank you so much for joining me on the show today, Phil. It's been a pleasure. It was a pleasure being here, and thank you for the conversation, Steve. I do appreciate it.